evening, everyone. Um, although he's probably a familiar face to a lot of you here today, I'll give him a formal introduction. So, Dr. Dirk Keen received his education at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he received a bachelor's in cell and molecular biology, and then his MD and PhD in neuroscience here at the University of Minnesota. He then performed his postgraduate medical training in anatomic and neuropathology at the University of Washington, where he earned a faculty position in neuropathology. Currently, Dr. Keene is the Nancy and Buster Albert Endowed Chair in Neuropathology, Associate Professor of Pathology, Adjunct Associate Professor of Ophthalmology and Neurological Surgery, Director of the Neuropathology Division, and Leader of the Neuropathology and Targeted Molecular Testing Corps at the University of Washington. Dr. Keene is board certified in anatomic pathology and neuropathology and attends on each of the clinical neuropathology subspecialties for UW Medicine. He also enjoys significant teaching and training opportunities, um, including the UW Graduate School course Path 513 Molecular Mechanisms of Neurodegeneration and is director of their neuropathology fellowship program. Dr. Keen strives to promote scientific advancement through diagnostic and research neuropathology and supervises a team of scientists, fellows, research coordinators, and histotechnologists who respectfully and expeditiously perform research autopsies in a manner that maximally and optimally preserves tissue for diverse applications for investigators around the country while providing accurate and timely neuropathological diagnoses according to the latest guidelines. Dr. Keen energetically promotes tissue and data sharing and the facilitation of local and national research through collaborative and cooperative mechanisms, and he strives to adapt existing and develop novel technologies to maximize the scientific utility of archived as well as prospectively acquired human brain tissue. The goal of this laboratory is to facilitate the development of diagnostic, therapeutic, and preventative approaches for neurodegenerative disease by combining traditional and precision neuropathological strategies in human tissues with experimental approaches and model systems. So I look forward to hearing his talk, and um, I'll turn it over to Dirk. <coughs> Thanks for that nice introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Maggie and I have been working on this for a couple of years, actually, trying to get this scheduled. So um, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks to the Lab Medicine and Pathology for having me here and the University of Minnesota. Um, it's really great to be back. I got to see some really familiar faces uh, last night, met some new ones, and um, look forward to meeting more people today. So as an introduction to this talk, and I'm happy to be interrupted for questions or anything. It's, it's, I, I don't have a ton of slides so that we can uh, be a little bit relaxed. This, I'm, I'm, this is the first time I've really tried to present um, the, the, the old and the new. So about two or three years ago, um, I decided that we really needed to update our approach for uh, research brain autopsies. Our focus for a long time, as you'll see, has been neurodegenerative disease, but we've been expanding the technology that has blossomed over the last decade, even the last few years, that can be applied to, to brain tissue and other, and other specimens is incredible and is not amenable to, you know, mixed tissue is just not amenable to this. And even flash frozen tissue isn't <clears throat> exactly optimal. So our goal, my goal, has been to really promote and facilitate science in brain disease and injury by doing my absolute best to get tissue from these incredible people who donate their brains to science, to really, really smart scientists applying these, these incredible technologies, and to do my best to, to, to characterize the tissue as we go along the way. So what I'm going to present is a, a bit of a historical perspective of our neural path core, which has, which has traditionally been uh, at the, uh, you know, one of the leaders in the country, and then to show you what we're, what we're doing now to sort of get into the next decade or so to, to support science. So let me know if there's any questions. I'm happy to, happy to stop. Let's see if I can get this thing working. So first I want to just, uh, and I, don't, I, I assume I need this for the uh, recording, but if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, first I want to introduce some key concepts. So uh, the first one is, as you can see, we have, uh, whoops, okay, this is going to be weird. So which way is which one's the pointer? There's the pointer. Okay, that, that didn't, there didn't work very good. Okay, um, 
So you can see here, we obviously have a human brain down here, which most of you probably noticed is a mouse brain. And um, I think this is a really important comparison to make, right? There's just the sheer volume of tissue that we have to deal with, but structurally, while basically they're the same, there are differences. And both are really critical to us <coughs> really understanding and, and developing solutions to disease. The um, human brain establishes relevance, right? Studying pathology, studying disease in human tissue tells us what's relevant and what's not relevant. Because if you don't have it in the human brain, in human disease, it's probably not relevant to what, we're, to what our goals are. Whereas the mouse uh, is essential. And when I say mouse, I say, I mean rat, I mean C. elegans, I mean any experimental system where you can really manipulate the variable, or where you can really control the variables, is, is essential for mechanism. So, so the way I think of, of what I do and how I facilitate science is to, help, uh, is to help establish relevance so that people can really focus in on testing mechanism through hypothesis generation from human brain and vice versa, and also testing and validation. And so I think that's a really critical component to why we want to do so much with these human brains, because at the end of the day, we need them to inform our models. Neuropathology, I think for this audience, it's probably, uh, this is probably not a necessary slide, but basically neuropathology is the study of the brain, which we usually study by sectioning and then looking at it under the microscope. That's really traditional neuropathology. Uh, neurodegenerative disease, of course, uh, I always want to emphasize it's progressive, usually irreversible. I don't know of any really reversible neurodegenerative disease, but hopefully that'll change. Uh, and it's usually classified by a specific lesion. Traditional neuropathology, where we've been stuck for a very long time, really started with Ramoni Cajal and the silver stains and other stains that he did in these beautiful drawings to, to this day are just, are just, are just artwork. It's, it's incredible. That continued through Alois Alzheimer, who through by studying the first Alzheimer's disease patient, August D, who probably actually by was probably actually a a, a mutant Alzheimer's disease, not a sporadic Alzheimer's disease, she was very young, uh, used the same technology that Ramoni Cajal did with silver stains to characterize plaques and tangles. And we had, we had an advancement of several decades ago in the form of immunohistochemistry. Some people in the room may remember when that started coming on. And, and we have a better way with tau stains and with amyloid stains to characterize the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. But that's where we are to this day. The guidelines, the, the, the current state-of-the-art guidelines for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease rely on this technology. And I think one of the ways that I and others really want to promote the field is to help us get beyond that, to understand, to use molecular technology and other, and other newer forms of, of, uh, of characterization of tissue to make these diagnoses. Uh, neurodegenerative disease is, of course, characterized by pathologic peptides. I think that the next, couple, the next couple concepts are going to be critical to solving these diseases. And this isn't new, we all know this. And we haven't figured it out yet, and that's really crazy. Alzheimer's disease, of course, is composed of tau and, and beta amyloid lesions in the form of, of neurofibrillary tangles and, and plaques, either diffuse plaques or senile plaques. Parkinson's disease and Lewy body, uh, Lewy body disease is characterized by al an alpha synucleinopathy, usually in the form of Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites. And of course, the FTLDs, now we have FTLD tau and FTLD TP uh, and ALS, for instance, are characterized by TP43 pathology. And so there's these specific peptides that we see in other diseases. A beta may actually be the only one that's really specific to Alzheimer's disease or to a disease. But they're, they're giving us a clue as to what's happening. And then, the other concept I think is really important is selective vulnerability. There are, each of these diseases has its own pattern of neurodegeneration. So for, for tau and Alzheimer's disease, it progresses from the medial temporal lobe out up into the isocortex and the neocortex. It's very different for A beta. A beta starts <coughs> in the neocortex and then progresses down into the deep cerebral structures through the brainstem and ultimately into the cerebellum. It's a, a, it's opposite pattern. It's very intriguing. For uh, alpha synuclein and Lewy bodies, it's, it starts in the brainstem generally, and works its way up into limbic system and then ultimately into neocortex. And then, of course, TDP43 uh, in ALS uh, involves motor cortex and, and spinal motor neurons, 
and then progresses through the other parts of the brain. Of course it's not that simple, but conceptually it's really important. If we can understand why these different diseases affect these different regions in this different pattern, it's going to give us, I think, essential clues to understanding how these diseases develop and progress, and of course to give us therapeutic targets. Another really important concept that uh, I focus on a lot is the states of neuropathology. And so I want to emphasize, first and foremost, that when I say Alzheimer's disease, when most neuropathologists say Alzheimer's disease, they're talking about the pathology that's happening in the brain, not the clinical, the clinical synthesis of pathology and clinical syndrome. It's, a, it's an important distinction, right? So we can have coronary artery disease without having a heart attack. We can also have Alzheimer's disease in our brains without having Alzheimer's dementia, and so that's really critical. And then when you start thinking about how you classify what's happening in the brain compared to what's happening to the person, it becomes a very interesting exercise and gives us clues to targets that may be important for preventing or staving the effects of these diseases. And so, of course, if you're an a asymptomatic person and you don't have any pathology in your brain and you're 40 years old, well, then you're just healthy. Right? That's great. If you're 95 years old, then most of us, and you don't have any plaques and tangles, most of us would consider you resistant. You've, you've managed to escape the disease, the normal disease progression of Alzheimer's. If you have, if you're impaired, if you're demented, and you've got pathology that you would ex expect in your brain, say high Alzheimer's disease pathology, then of course you have you have penetrant injury or disease, right? So you've got Alzheimer's disease, you've got Alzheimer's dementia. And that's fine. What what becomes really interesting is this category that I'm really I'm really fascinated by. And those are the people who are not demented. Or in the case of traumatic brain injury, you're not impaired, or in the case of Parkinson's disease, don't have a motor problem, but have high pathology. So you have dense brain stem Lewy bodies or you have high Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change, and yet you're not demented. We think of that as either, either resilience in people, in people who you would absolutely expect to be demented, or in some other phase, latent or preclinical disease. And understanding why some people with the same amounts of pathology in their brain will be demented or not is going to really help us understand, identify, and, and develop develop treatments for these therapeutic targets. Really key concepts. These these drive us in the neuropath core, right? We think about we think about you know how do we how do we uh, preserve these brains? How do we study these brains and characterize these brains in a way that can help us understand these concepts? And so the the major gap in knowledge that 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 I am. Uh, really focused on with, with my research is, is mechanisms of resilience and resistance to disease or to injury. And so um, I just want to start again, I said, like I said, I'm going to start with a bit of history of the neuropath core. So um, in um, 1985, actually, uh, these two guys and then this other guy, so this is Eric Larson, this is uh, Bud Kukul, Bud is the head of the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. Eric is the start of the Adult Changes in Thought study, and George Martin is a famous neurogeneticist who started the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at UW, among a million other things. He's, I'm not sure if he's 90 yet, but he just got another R01. So he is resilient or resistant, one of the two. It's amazing. <laughs> so I want what George has. Um, and then Jim Leverins and Dave Noshlin, um, they started the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in the ACT study back in the late 80s and had the vision to ask people to donate their brain, even back then. This was, there were the only people that were doing it, but, but to get these studies off the ground, and that have been continuously funded and continuously active since that day that they started, has been a real benefit to science. And you'll see in the repository that we've built, and that I am the humble steward of, it's all thanks to these guys getting things started way back when. Uh, in 2002, the University of Washington recruited Tom Montine uh, to come. He's a neuropathologist. Uh, he's, uh, so Walt's my PhD mentor, and Tom is my neuropathology mentor, and, um, and Brent, 
of course. Brent's the one who got the bug for me. Um, but Tom came, and Tom did some really great things. The first thing he did is he brought some really smart people, Randy Walter, uh, Jing Zhang, and Amy Shantz. And they instituted some really critical to, uh, some really critical updates to the autopsy program. <laughs> Tom instituted rapid autopsies, meaning if we did an autopsy within a certain period of time, we would take tissue that was frozen so that we could apply other types of techniques than just standard formalin fixed paraffin embedded section type techniques like, like histology and chemistry. He also standardized sampling so that when we go back to an autopsy in 2002, to one that was in 2010, to one that was in 2015, or yesterday, that basic standard sampling is still there. So every time some researcher comes to us and says, I want to study this brain region, we know that we can go back and in every one of these cases have it, have it dissected and preserved the exact same way. It seems simple, but it's, you'd be surprised how many changes happen over time. And so have it, developing a, a repository, right, you have to have vision, you have to have a commitment to really staying the course, and, uh, and you have to really work hard to, to take that resource as you develop it and then start to, and then start to analyze it and, and demonstrate its utility to keep things going. And that's what they did. Uh, Tom recruited Josh and myself, and then of course we have Caitlin Latimer, who's there now, who's a superstar. And you'll be hearing a lot about Caitlin Latimer over the next 20 or 30 years, I'm sure. Um, and, so, and so that's where the Neuropath core sort of stood. Uh, I took over in 2013, and so I'll talk to you a little bit about the Neuropath core and then what my sort of vision has been since 2013 and since our sort of transformation in the last few years. So we have, we have six components of our core mission, uh, all of which is dedicated to supporting brain aging, injury, and neurodegeneration research. Any other brain research, of course, but that's our major focus. Our first mission, and probably our most important, is to build and maintain a, a highly accessible, and I emphasize highly accessible, right? If the brains are in the bank and nobody gets to use them, it's worthless. A highly accessible and appropriately safeguarded biorepository. That's a critical component of our mission. We provide diagnostic expertise. Of course, we analyze, we provide diagnoses for the cases that come through our neuropath core, but we also serve as a community liaison. We support a lot of other diagnostic efforts, both locally and nationally. Tom set the stage by, he was one of the two uh, co-directors, the co-chairman of the uh, current criteria to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. He's been nationally very prominent, and I've gotten lucky enough to be a part of some of, the, some of these kinds of things lately. Uh, we maintain a rich training environment, right? That may seem obvious, it may not, but you can't build a research resource without having researchers to study it. And so Maggie is an example, Caitlin is, in, is, is an example. We, uh, we strive to train the next generation of scientists and clinicians. And so over the past five years, I think we've had a, over 150 trainees, medical students, residents, fellows, scientists from other places come through our Neuropath Corps in one way or another to train. Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of is, is to develop, is to innovate, right? To not just stay the course, but to continue to try to innovate and stretch the field so that we are honoring the people that donate these brains by, by maximally utilizing these tissues. We foster mechanistic research, right? We don't just study human brains. We provide our expertise, we provide our technology, we provide our resources to help people doing basic science, whether that's in cells, whether that's in C. elegans, whether that's in mice, whether that's in dogs and monkeys. We're participating in all that research. And then finally, we promote local and national research through all of the above, all of the above sort of components. We support a lot of studies. Um, we, support, we support a ton of studies, but these are the ones that at, we actually bring in autopsies and perform autopsies for. I want to highlight a couple. So, of course, the ADRC is basically how we were founded. Right? We were founded as, as part of our Alzheimer's Center. It's a critical component to what we study, and, and a, major, a major strength in, Minis in Washington is, uh, I do, I've been doing this ever since I got here. I keep calling it Minnesota. 
Um, is a, a, we have a neurogeneticist out there, Tom Bird, who's, who's totally famous. I knew about him when I was here training very early. But we have a, a ton of different families with all kinds of different, um, you know, unusual mutations. So including a lot of spinal cerebellar ataxia cases from Tom. Uh, and so that's been a, a real, a real um, uh, great resource for the, for the core. <coughs> but I want to highlight a couple. The adult changes in thought study, why is that important? I don't have a slide talking about ACT. I do have a lot of data slides, uh, just summary slides, talking about the impact that ACT has had. But ACT is a community-based cohort. So this is a cohort where in, if, for certain people in, the, in, a, in HMO in Seattle, group health, when they turned 65, they were randomly invited to enter this trial. And it's, a, it's just a longitudinal trial to study brain aging. And so every two years they come in, they get characterized with psychometric testing. They're participating in other research. They have all of their medical records, all their pharmacy data, everything in the HMO that's available to the study. It's a, it's a unique study. The average length of pharmacy data that each of these people has associated with them is about 35 years of drugs. You don't get that anywhere else. Um, they're up to about 5,500 participants. They're offered uh, the opportunity to donate their brain, about 30% uh, agree to. And it's been, it's been one of three or four national studies that has really laid the groundwork for us to understand late onset Alzheimer's disease in, in, the, in the community, right? Not people with a genetic predisposition, not people that, are, that come into an Alzheimer's disease because they're, they're having problems. These are randomly selected people, and it is a fantastic, it's a fantastic cohort. And then I want to emphasize a couple other things that I won't talk much more about, but just to let you know that it's not all about Alzheimer's disease. It's not all about dementia. Um, uh, <coughs> about four or five years ago, uh, along with a fellow at the time who's now the head of our autopsy service, uh, Desiree Marshall, we started the Pacific Northwest Brain Donor Network. The vision for that was to, to, to build a hub resource using the infrastructure of the Neuropath Core to allow us to go out and, and study other autopsy cohorts, right? And so our, our original focus was on uh, the military and blast exposure because it's such, a, it's such an epidemic from our Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts. And so that program has now blossomed into supporting also the Allen Brain Institute Cell Types Atlas. And so the Allen Institute, as you know, is based in Seattle and is very interested in mapping the brain. They've done it with transcriptome. Now they're doing it for cell types, and we're providing them with normal brains, people aged 18 to 60 years old without any major neurological disease to understand the normal brain. These are all great. And the most recent thing that we started was our neuro-oncology uh, brain repository. This is, a, this is a repository for glioblastoma primarily. We have a consent. We're in the clinics. We've had our first six or seven cases. These are people who've had surgical tissue banked in, as part of our neurosurgical bio repository so that we can understand the changes that happen in these tumors with time from the time they're diagnosed and resected all the way through to the time they die. And that's great, right? There's all kinds of great molecular techniques that are being applied here. But what I'm really interested in as well is what's happening to the brain of these people. These people are getting radiated, they're getting chemotherapy, they're getting knives stuck in their brain. What's happening to their brain and how do we protect their brain while we try to kill that tumor? And, and I think there's going to be huge benefits to that as well with this brain repository. So I won't talk any more about any of that other stuff today, but just know that we, uh, we are expanding and we are really active in trying to develop these resources. Believe it or not, there's not a great glioblastoma brain bank anywhere in the country. It's shocking, but you, people have been focused on tumors, on the, t on the surgicals. So, what, so how does the neuropath work, or how did it work? So, uh, and I'm going to show some brain pictures. Too late. Sorry, I showed one. So if anybody's queasy about I mean, this, is sort of a pathology <laughs> talk, so it's kind of okay. But um, the, way that, the way that this has worked for a long time is if we were able to get an autopsy within eight hours. And for a long time, it was the pathologist on call. Uh, and then we grew and grew, and finally we had uh, we developed a tech service that actually that actually does this for us. And so they're on call. The pathologist comes in if needed. The pathologist is responsible for verifying ID, for verifying consent. Um, but one way or another, if someone dies, we mobilize. We come in. We get that person in as soon as possible. And if we can get their brain within eight, within eight hours, we do a rapid autopsy where we dissect one half of the brain uh, and actually cut out a bunch of different little pieces. 
And so that's, you can't read that, I'm sure it's too small, I'll show you that bigger in a minute, but, but we've been doing this since basically 2002, this is what Tom instituted. And so all of those different brain regions are, are stored in the freezer for anybody who had a rapid autopsy. When we started, it was the pathologist, we were pretty good at this, we got about 50% of the cases as a rapid autopsy. Um, uh, as, we, as we put more resources into this, developed call teams, We've gotten it up to where right now it's uh, close to 90% of our cases are, are rapid autopsies, which is pretty darn good. Most most of the repositories out there just have fixed tissue, um, and then of course all the brains, whether it's a rapid or non-rapid, get fixed. And we have this is the standard sampling protocol, and I'll I'll talk about this again in a minute. This is uh, so this is just an expanded view of the frozen tissue we we were taking from every brain. For the for the act the act cohort, and this is basically the same for all the other brains that we got, and so you can see each of the letters is a cassette. So for we take five cassettes of midfrontal, five cassettes of temporal, right? And so those are all those were all flash frozen liquid nitrogen, stored in the freezer, and they're there to this day. We have 15 minus 80 freezers full of these specimens. Some of the older cases have a lot of these regions are exhausted at this point, right? They've been used up. But that's a, good, that's a sign of a good, productive neuropath core, that we are using the samples. And so that's the biorepository that's available. So one of the things that I was hoping in coming here would be to engage people who may be interested in human research but may not know, you know ways to, to access some of this tissue. We have lots of it at UW. We work with a lot of other brain banks around the country. Um, and I would be happy to talk to anybody about helping them fill in their needs as far as human tissue when, uh, if, if they're interested. Um, and then, of course, there's a diagnostic expertise component of what we do. Um, we uh, continue to apply the latest guidelines, and I say that with, without, with all due respect to my esteemed colleagues. Everybody, that, everybody that's on, this paper, on these papers are world-class neuropathologists or some relation of, of them. And these are the guidelines we use. And like I said, these are from 2012. These are using old technology. These are using immunohistochemical stains, silver stains, right? This is basically photographic development technology. It's been around since the 1800s. <laughs> it's, that's where we're at in this field. And so, um, and so we work really hard to provide the consultative service to the level that we're expected as a minimum for every case. To expand on that a little bit, I'll talk about this process in, in a little bit. Um, but we, we basically take standardized sections and, and the IHC stains from the guidelines. And the nice thing is, since Tom was one of the co-chair co -chair people of the guidelines, they were basically built out of UW, UW and MGH, pretty much. So we didn't have to change much to, uh, to, to basically fit. I don't think this is very abnormal for any other neuropath core around the country. We were all doing this based on earlier guidelines. But this is, this is the standard sampling for fixed tissue and pretty, pretty standard workup, right? I mean, it may need to be updated a little bit, but those are the stains. So for those of you, you know, counting the, count the stains and the dollars, it's not trivial, right? It's a, it's a big workup to, to, to go after. But every case gets, these, get this, gets this workup. A neuropath report is generated. Maggie knows, uh, she was part of this. They're usually four to five pages long, uh, and they're automatically sent to the study that, who then can share the information with their participants and their families as they prefer. <coughs> uh, that's just an example diagnostic page, and this gets updated every time there's a new guideline. So you can see right now we have late. Late is a newer diagnosis uh, for an older problem, right? This is age-related TP43 proteinopathy. And so we just update so that the clinicians, the research studies can look through this and they, uh, they can get a quick picture. We also have this all in red cap and it's all automatically transferred to the studies and so they get the data. So this is a, uh, a narrative report mm -hmm. or it's it's narrative. data elements in discrete fields in a database of the background? Exactly. So it's a narrative report so that if it, some of the studies like to just give it to the family. So we just, we, it's just like any other autopsy report. Mm -hmm. But then the, the data field, there's 130 of them or so, are available for the study so they don't have to go dissect these reports. <coughs> and that's always up, getting updated. All right, so the early impact of the, of the neuropath core, 
I'll, I'll breeze through this, and this is a little weird for me, so I'm going I'm I'm to show a lot of studies but not go into a lot of detail about things, just to try to emphasize how impactful a, a, play, a core like this can be, and to convince people that, you know, the more of these around the country, the better, right? The more of these tissue resources we're generating for local researchers and for national studies, the better. Um, but, the, but very early on, the ACT study and the Alzheimer's Center were important for, for starting to show what, what pathology we were seeing in community-based samples, right? So before that, we were seeing studies that were very, very biased and focused on early onset Alzheimer's disease, pure Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these are the first studies that really started to show that old people in the community get lots of things. And there's a lot of things that can cause dementia. The other thing, one of the early advantages to the to this study was because ACT is is a study in which they know who gets an autopsy and who doesn't because they don't require it. We actually know what you know. We actually understand the selection bias that goes into someone volunteering for an autopsy and can actually correct for that when we are when we are applying findings from the, from the broader study, and I think that was a really important early finding, early paper. Josh Sonnen trained at UW. Uh, he, was, he started at the same time I did, but he already had his AP and CP training done, so he finished early, and he had a tremendous impact from the ACT study. His first paper in Annals um, really, really described the population, the cohort at the time, uh, which was small. It was only a few hundred, a few hundred people. He followed up with publications uh, that were really important in, in describing vascular brain injury as a critical component, number two, and a close number two, to Alzheimer's disease and causing dementia in the community. We don't think about that a lot, but these microinfarcts, these strokes, these little strokes, vascular, vascular disease is a huge contributor to, to dementia. And then he published this paper, which I think is one of the best papers ever, it's, uh, the, the title alone is fantastic, right? Ecology of the Aging Human Brain, in which he basically focused on, on non-demented people and, and demented people and tried to understand what is, the, what is the progression, what is happening in the community with their brain. And he, and he came up with, I'm sure he wasn't the first person to do this, but it's a really sort of elegant, statistically unfound or unvalid, probably, uh, summary neuropathology score. So he just took Lewy bodies and he took <laughs> Alzheimer's disease pathology and he took microinfarcts and he just summed them. And and what and what and at that time we only had 116 autopsies in the ACT cohort. But what you can but what you can see is that there's a wide range of pathology that you're seeing in this community-based sample. There's a lot of stuff other than al Alzheimer's disease is of course blue and Alzheimer's disease is prevalent. In, in the right, it's hard to find somebody who's old. The average age, age of the ACT participant is, at death is 89 years old. It's hard to find somebody 89 years old without some Alzheimer's pathology. That's why resilience and resistance is so interesting. But there's a lot of other stuff happening in these people, right? And then he went on to, to take the summary neuropathology score and just use this very simple graph to demonstrate how important the burden of total pathology is to. To, your, to, to basically having dementia, right? It's simple, it doesn't have to be Alzheimer's, it doesn't have to be vascular brain injury, you just, you just need some level of burden and, and you're more likely to have dementia. It seems simple, but it was a really important paper at the time. Uh, ACT has been spectacularly important, and this is really focused on the neuropathology of ACT, but in understanding epidemiology. So before Tom and Eric, I don't know if anybody was really focused. I mean, the Nunn study was 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 re really probably visionary as far as this goes. Um, but Tom and Eric really pushed the limits of neuropath with respect to epidemiology in the community using the ZAC cohort. And they, they published a, a, a lot of very important early papers focused on, and I'm just going to run through some of these, atrial fibrillation, blood pressure and brain injury, uh, cigarette smoking, Right? We've all heard about, you know, cigarette smokers are less likely to get PD. Well, it's true. We don't know why, but it's true. Um, NSAIDs, right? NSAIDs, very important. Uh, statins, very important for, for understanding disease. This was a paper I was lucky to be a part of associating traumatic brain injury with incident Parkinson's disease and Lewy body pathology, not Alzheimer's, which is what had always been thought. 
By the way, this has been validated in the Kaiser network of 90 plus thousand people in California. Um, uh, glucose, diabet diabetes. There's a very nice New England Journal article from the ACT study uh, on on uh, glucose, uh, blood glucose levels and dementia. More, more opioids and, and NSAIDs, and then of course cholesterol, and of course the anticholinergics and how they're affecting people. So my my parents are both are both demented, and they were both on anticholinergics when they came up to live with me from from Nevada, and so that was one of the first things we did was to get them off it. And, and to this day, there's a lot of primary care docs who don't get it right that acetylcholine and cholinesterase inhibitors they all interact to 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 cause problems. Um, and then of course Brandon published another nice paper and then and then we've had some recent impacts. So I just added these this morning. I just went into uh, PubMed and grabbed the first few that I saw for that are of the most recent papers. Uh, there was a very nice uh, paper that came out of t with Tim Holman uh, focusing on sex, sex differences in genetics. So all of these act subjects have had their have their genetics analyzed at the SNP level at least. And so there's very interesting differences between men and women. A lot of really important information. I think Maggie's on one of these papers came out of the NUN study about how nuns are more prone to have more pure Alzheimer's disease in men in women, whereas men are more prone to have a mixture of vascular brain injury and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there was a recent article that just came out in Nature that I'm really proud of, and is sort of the this is through the Allen Institute basically, uh, where they let they're using our infrastructure to pull. Uh, surgical material and do cell types analysis in the different brain and compare that to mice. And they found some very interesting differences at the transcriptome level in the single cell analysis between mice and humans, which may may have some, if, some implications for why a lot of our therapies that work in mice don't work in humans. Uh, there's a, another nice article that uh, came out of a collaboration with our group in uh, Karen Ash here at University of Minnesota. Um, at where she did, I think, a very interesting uh, analysis looking at a, a tau fragment that's generated by caspase 2. It's the delta tau 314, I think is what it is, and how that's associated with Lewy body dementia, but not Lewy body disease, not specifically Parkinson's disease. Um, there was a nice uh, article out of Stan Prusner's lab showing how the, you know, the prion hypothesis for these pathologic peptides and how they progressed, that there's an age there's an age difference, and that, that, that kind of slows down and may not explain everything for Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is the late, the new consensus working group. Our, our center supported a lot of that paper with data and, of course, support. Maggie was a part of that consensus conference. Uh, and, then, uh, and then most recently in Science Translation, or JCI, um, a nice article out of Wake Forest focused on uh, EF2 kinase. So, we continue, and they have human tissue from our bank that we used to validate the findings they had in the mice that they, that they used. Mm -hmm. So we continue to have an impact. I, 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 I'll speed up a little bit. So our productivity, I'm very proud. And this is, you know, we, we stand on the, shoulder, the shoulders of giants, and that's what this is for. But we have a very, a very robust repository at this point. We have 3,500 plus brains. Um, we have thousands and thousands of, of paraffin blocks, but also thousands and thousands of frozen blocks, right, which is really great. Uh, we've been collecting meninges now on, on every case, whether it's a rapid or not, and growing fibroblast cultures to generate IPS, I, to reprogram them into IPS cells, uh, which I think is going to be a tremendous resource down the road. Uh, we've been doing a really good job with that. And, and, and our productivity over the last five years continues to rise. So I'm very proud of this. Right? This means that we are contributing to science. We're, 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 last year, in 2018, we gave almost 8,000 tissue samples out to people around the country and around the world to support science. Uh, that results in more and more publications. That, re that results in more and more grants. We tried to figure it out for our competitive renewal. We, we think we support over $50 million in grants alone just in each year. So it's really, really uh, an honor to be shepherding this along. <clears throat> This is who's in our. This is who's in our core, not counting glioblastoma and trauma people. Um, this is again that summary neuropath score. Um, this is everybody that we have from the ACT, SLS, and ADRC cohorts. Uh, we see AD, vascular brain injury, and Lewy body disease, and it's just a summation, just like Josh did way back when. 
And we've split these into people who are non-demented, people who are demented, and people who are somewhere in between, the MCI, which is difficult to classify. And what you'll notice, we've made an arbitrary cutoff of three, of this summary score of three. This cutoff could go up or down. But the idea is, if you're demented, and you have enough Alzheimer's pathology, then you have Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's dementia. But if you don't have enough Alzheimer's disease, it's something else. And you can see almost everybody here has lots of blue. So it's these people that would be something, something else. What's really interesting is the non-demented yeah. component. And you can see there's a ton of people in our cohort who are non-demented. That's thanks to the ACT study, right? Because it's a community sample, we're not selecting people for cognitive impairment. And so we have a ton of non-demented people. And you can see in those non-demented people, just the way that, that uh, pathology goes up, there are some people who are non-demented who have a boatload of pathology, right? These people have a ton of pathology. And so we think if you're below this cur this line here, right in here, that you are old and you have resisted the, the onset of pathology. If you're above this line, and again, it's an arbitrary line, you we classify you as resilient. And we're trying to understand where that line should be, right? That, maybe the line should be way up here, and there's not, not anything that's really resilience, right? We don't know. But we decided to look much more closely at this. And so we, uh, we took just the ACT cohort, which currently is about 850 autopsies, and we picked the most stringent criteria possible to classify resilience and resistance. We took non-demented people. They had to have been seen within two years. So, and that may be too much for some people, right? We may need to get more stringent, but that's kind of difficult in some of these studies. For if you were re classified as resistant, you had to be 85 years old or greater, had to have a Brock stage less than four, so you can have part, but you can't have Alzheimer's disease, and no plaques. Uh, if you were resilient, we didn't care what age you were. We just, you just needed to be, to have Brock six, so the highest amount of neurofibrillary degeneration that we classify currently. And you had to have frequent plaques, so the highest level of Alzheimer's disease pathology is how we classify it. And then controls had to be demented, they had to be Brock six, and they had to be also high plaques. And here's what we found. So out of 800 some people using these stringent criteria, we found, I think it's 14 people that we could classify as resistant. People who had, the, who had got very old, who were not demented, and had very low pathology. It's very unusual. People get Alzheimer's disease pathology when they get old. What's more interesting to me is we only found seven people that we could classify as resilient from 800 people in the cohort when we really, really <coughs> stringently classified that. And, and then we tried to figure out what the difference was. And so we looked at the diagnoses, and you'll see we've included TDP43. TDP43 is a nuclear protein um, that's been recently described. It's associated with ALS, frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Well, it turns out it, it happens in old age a lot, and that's the point of this limbic-associated TDP43 uh, disease, this late disease that, that was recently diagnosed. It turns out the number one primary distinguishing characteristic between being resilient and not is whether, you know, whether or not you have TDP. We think TDP, and we have an R01 that we're writing right now to try to understand how TDP43 synergizes with tau to, to cause neurodegeneration. When I say neurodegeneration in this context, I mean it's killing the tissue. When you look at TDP43 involved tissue, it's, it's horrible. It's gliotic, you see neuron loss, you see all kinds of problems. Whereas you can have tau in tissue that is not reasonably high, and it looks pretty good. And so we think that there's some relationship between TDP43 and tau, and the reason is we used uh, image analysis techniques to, to quantify the amount of tau and the amount of TDP43, and sure enough, in the TDP43, in the resilient cases, you have either quantitatively more tau, even though our staging criteria are don't see that because that's how bad our criteria are, uh, or you have TDP43, and you can see here the differences between the resilient cases and the dementia through the, through the different regions. And so that was recently published. We're following that up by looking at the whole cohort with less stringent criteria, but I, I'm really excited about that. So now I'm going to get to the, to, I'm going to close here in the last 10 minutes by talking about what we're, what we're trying to do, right? So the first thing is, um, is to just sort of give you my vision of what we are doing and what we can do. So this is where we're at. 
we have a cohort where we have resistant, resilient people and controls. And if we have uh, silver stains and immunized to chemistry, I've sort of shown you what we can do, right? With the, with the resilient staining, uh, with the uh, immunized to chemistry staining, with all the different papers that have been published over the years. We do pretty good with standard practice, but we can do better. The current state of the art is, uh, and this is actually probably getting dated already, but the current state of the art is, is sort of tissue level omics, right? Proteomics, transcriptomics, where you take a piece of tissue, you grind it up, you measure all the gene expression, you look for protein, lipidome, whatever. That's kind of stated, that's the current state of the art. What I think is where we need to go, and this is why we're transforming our, our neuropath core, is, uh, is what we're calling sort of precision neuropathology, getting more and more accurate and precise with respect to the measurements that we're trying to do, whether that's single cell transcriptome, single cell epigenome, spatial transcriptomics. I think, just like we're doing with the surgical specimens from the epilepsy cases, I think we can get autopsies from people and we can take slice cultures and we can understand function in those brain maybe. We can do it, we, can, we should at least try, I think, to try to understand how these neurons are working in these people as a way to, to really understand brain function at the neuropathological level. So that's where we want to go. So, um, so there's lots of different ways to do this. I'm going to skip through this a little bit. These are the ways that are sort of the state of the art um, between unbiased stereology, this histolite approach, which I'll probably skip over, which is um, really cool. We did this in 2015 on formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. I'll talk about it briefly. Uh, we, have a, we have been taking synaptosomes from different regions of brain fresh um, as a way to measure synaptic injury. We've been doing that for f f five or six years now. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can, we, can, we can do quantitative neuropathology to supplement the traditional methods. So briefly for histolide, and I am running out of time, so I'll go quickly. Histolide is just a way to do an ELISA on a formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue section. And so you, you, use, you use paranitrophenol, just like you would in a normal ELISA. You get a solution phase chromogen reaction. You measure that absorbance using Beer's Law. And then you restain it with a typical immunohistochemical type of a reagent that stains the tissue. And what you get is you get really quantitative data from the solution phase, and then you get an immunohistochemical stain section. In this case, it's tau. It turns out to be highly quantitative, and it's really exciting. So that's the paper where we describe the, the method. And of course, this is the genius of Tom Montine, not me. And then there have been several papers that have been published since. I want to highlight two. This one uh, looked at the first 325 cases in ACT, and without going into great detail, I'll tell you that the quantitation of tau added 10% predictive power to, the, to, to dementia compared to traditional neuropaths of Brock and Sirad. So being able to quantify things gives us a better, a better ability to, bin, to, to understand the impact, the impact of the pathology on the person's function. I think it's really important. I think this justifies all the efforts we've gone to to try to get more quantitative methods. And then, of course, this is a nice paper that Maggie just published uh, last year, I think, um, with Tom looking at um, uh, analgesics in this data set. So, for a modern, so this, so now I'm going to show you four or five slides of what we're trying to do. The first part is to update the biorepository, right? So I told you about rapid autopsies. I told you about dissecting out pieces of brain. Well, guess what? If we didn't dissect out that piece of brain and froze it and freeze it, and somebody wants another piece of brain, too bad. We didn't have it. So we want to change that. And so what we've done is we've expanded our protocol to 12-hour PMI because the 8-hour PMI was really for oxidative uh, reagent, for uh, free radical injury sort of markers, isoprostanes. And so I've extended it to 12. Uh, we've adapted the protocol from the Allen Institute, and so basically we take a fresh brain, we take half a brain, we take the meninges off, some of them we keep and we grow cells from, and then we put this, the fresh brain in a, in a, in a jig, uh, you can see it from the top, and the cerebellum is taken off and put there, and then we, and then we embed it in al dental alginate, this is dental cement, it fixes in about five minutes, it's fantastic, and it smells like peppermint, so the whole room smells like peppermint. <laughs> You end up with a you end up with a with a dental cement lock with a brain in it, uh, and then we have this this custom built jig that we use, and we cut these sections into into four. These are four millimeter thick fresh brain, 
oh, and they come out really nice. And, and then we, we have them all laid out, so every other section we fix in form one, and every other one we freeze, and we freeze them using an isopentane, a uh, super-cooled isopentane slurry, just like we do with muscle biopsies. And that preserves the architecture. So instead of throwing something in liquid nitrogen, which causes all kinds of cracking and breaking, this preserves the architecture beautifully for single-cell analysis and all kinds of other things. This is what the Allen Institute is doing. This is what we're doing, but they're doing it a centimeter thick, we're doing four millimeters thick, which, so I'm pretty proud of that. And, it, and they look fantastic when you get them out. They, and so what we'll do is we'll have the whole brain available for frozen tissue analyses. It'll be perfectly preserved, hopefully, for single cell profiling. And you can get any part of the brain now, because we're keeping all this. How we pay for all the freezers we're gonna need, I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's one thing. The next thing that we're doing on every brain is we're getting an MRI. So. Um, so we embed the brains in this in this agarose. That, that's a brain. That's agarose. Uh, you get a brain block, just a big block of agarose, and then that uh, you can see the brain from the side, and then that goes in these. That's in these buckets, and those. Oh, by the way, the round one is a big brain. That's like a younger person's brain, and so those have to go in the the circular ones, uh, and they go up. It's really weird, but they go in the MRI, and UW is not nearly as advanced. With radio, with the with MRI technology, than you guys are, I would love to get brains over here at CMR. So, but we have a three Tesla magnet. Every single brain gets imaged, and um, and we can see lesions, right, on these scans that you don't see grossly. We would never sample those. So now we have a whole new sampling protocol that's based on just the imaging and the image guided sampling, so that we can see these lesions. And it turns out you can detect some very subtle lesions. This is a bull rider. This was his in-life MRI about two and a half years before he died, showing his, his uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. This is his ex vivo MRI where you can see a little bit, but you can't see anything on the gross. We wouldn't have sampled that. And yet, he has traumatic axonal injury and an old, an old bleed. Another thing we're doing, as I said, our brains, uh, once they've been embedded, they go onto our brain slicer. This is not a deli meat slicer, that's a brain slicer. <laughs> And they get cut, same thing, four millimeters. Why do we pick four millimeters for everything? Well, it's because cassettes are four millimeters deep. So these things fit perfect for cassettes. You get a deck of cards, which is the brain. They get laid out, they all get photographed. And we've been doing this for 10, 11, 12 years now. And so you get these very nice, it doesn't look good here, but they're great high definition photographs that um, we use this Amira software uh, to reconstruct a 3D volumetric brain that can be plugged into MRI technology like FreeSurfer. And so we're reconstructing, we have about 900 brains that were cut this way that don't have an MRI. And we're using this to do some crude volumetric measurements, which is way better than we can do as pathologists. So we're really excited about that. And the correlation is very close. So this is the MRI calculations, and this is our 3D reconstruction calculations. And you can see we have very strong correlation. So we're excited about that. Um, okay, <laughs> sorry. We've expanded our sampling. Brent's going to cringe at this. We've expanded our sampling from our 22 blocks to sample, we now routinely sample 82 regions of brain. The reason is because there's a lot of, there's a lot of areas of the brain that we need to be looking where we haven't traditionally. And just a few of those are these functional connectivity networks, right? These different nodes that are important for brain function. And we don't know what's going on in those in Alzheimer's disease. And so we've started routinely sampling all of these, all of these blocks. We don't look at all of them all the time. But we're sampling all of these different blocks from all of our brains so that we have the ability to see these rather than having them sit in a bucket for years and years before we take them. Um, uh, one of the last things I want to show you is in these fixed brains, if we're interested in, in something uh, of high magnification, we can take little samples like this and this. So that's gray matter, that's white matter. And we can, using a, a, a new technology, using cinnamon oil, now there's different ways to do this, but cinnamon oil tends to be gentle on the tissue, so we use cinnamon oil to clear the tissue. This is slight clarity. Uh, but you can see, you can, these are the pieces of brain right here. You can see through them. That's a three millimeter thick piece of brain. And once, this is a lectin stain. I, I run, if I run this movie, it takes about five minutes going from the front to the back of all these, all these capillaries. It's fantastic. And so this, these lectins work really well. This is, a, this is a PHF tau antibody. You can see a tangle. 
So the goal is to multi to, to do uh, multiple stains on these things and, and understand the 3D organization of the brain from the vasculature to the plaques and tangles to the neurons. And so we're, we're sort of developing this. We've developed, uh, uh, we've, ad we've advanced histolide, so that histolide now is an extraction of F FFPE tissue. Um, <coughs> and we put a lot of work into this with controls, with, uh, with control peptides. But basically what this does is it takes a, an FFPE section, we can generate an extract, we can run it through serial extractions from a salt to a mild detergent to guanidine, and then that actually can be used uh, with multiplex kits that you, or you can customize the kit from these Luminex ranges. We can do it for Quanteryx, we can do it for, for Mesoscale, and you get multiplex and analytics, highly quantitative analytics, which is sort of the next generation histolide, and we just published this paper. And finally, um, we're generating these IPS cells. Uh, everybody, I think, knows we take meninges, other people take skin, but we take meninges at the autopsy because we can have the cells generated exactly the same first time the person died. We know their pathology. We can generate your typical reprogramming protocol to neurons to study these, these cells and then learn more about the brain. But what Jessica Young at the UW has been doing, which is really cool, is taking the fiberglass cultures and converting them directly into neurons to test, to sort of maintain that epigenetic signature for these cells. We think that's going to be a real powerful tool for all of our autopsies. And that was just recently published. So here's my vision. You take really, really well characterized cohorts, like the ACT cohort. You do a really great job of studying that tissue in that person uh, in an integrated manner, qualitative and quantitative. And then you use those studies to inform experimental models so that we can learn more about these diseases and test <coughs> drugs. So that's what we're shooting for with all of what we're doing. We've done this already. This is a, a study we did with the Allen where we, where I'm not going to go through all this, but we basically took and, and divided up the work so that we did a really immense quantitative analysis of the brain. They did whole, whole tissue level transcriptomics and all of that data is published in the Brain Aging and Dementia Atlas. We didn't find anything for TBI, by the way, which is what spurred me to go single cell rather than bulk tissue. That was published recently in eLife, and, so, um, and so now the next step for us is we have a U19 uh, out. It got a score that was under last year's funding level, so we'll see, um, which is focused on, a, on bringing cell types analysis, single cell epigenomics, and single cell transcriptomics to Alzheimer's disease in a collaboration using the tissues that we're generating with the Allen Institute technology. I'm super duper excited about it. I'm going to skip through the goals, but I think it's, it's going to be a highly impactful study if we're able to get funded for this. Um, we'll see, but that's the next sort of stage for, for my lab and what I want to do from the Neuropath Corps perspective. So that's all I have. I'm sorry I'm uh, five minutes over. It takes, a, it takes a village, right? It takes a, it takes a huge <laughs> amount of people to, to do this. This is just a fraction of them. I haven't mentioned my funding sources, but NIH, DOD, institutional funds, and of course the Nancy and Buster Albert, fam the, the Albert family, Nancy and Buster Albert, Albert, and everything else. So I want to thank everybody here. I want to emphasize that uh, brain donation, none of this happens without these amazing people who donate their brains, which I think is the biggest gift you could give to science. And so I'll stop there, take any questions, and thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, has neuropathology made any progress in the severe psychotic diseases such as severe schizophrenia? Right, it's a great, great question. So uh, the question was, has neuropathology made any advances with as far as severe psychiatric diseases, schizophrenia being being one of them? So there, there, there are. Um, so I'm not. That's not something that I pay attention to. So I don't know about that. But there are huge efforts, uh, just like are being done in Alzheimer's disease to go in and study pe people with these kinds of autism is another is another oh, yeah. thing, right big one right. where they're trying to apply these single cell techniques and so my understanding is there are some imaging findings that may be promising to understand how people function differently particularly with functional MRI right. uh, I don't know about the other the other components at this point so I, I guess I would have to punt on that one any other questions sorry that was a lot and it's early. Yes, sir. Uh, could you um, 
comment upon uh, what's going on with uh, uh, imaging right now mm -hmm. uh, in cognitive disorder patients? So, so the question is, what's going on with imaging in cognitive disorder? It's a, it's a great question. There's a lot of, there's a lot of money being poured into this. So there's the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, right? The ADNI study, which is focused on, uh, on both PET. So there's, there's PET ligands for A-beta that are basically approved clinically. There's also clinical trials for tau. So there's a lot of research on imaging as far as trying to, trying to identify the pathology. And then there's a lot of functional imaging uh, that's really focused on these different networks, these connectivity networks, and trying to understand how those are affected in, all, in Alzheimer's disease and dementia and, and what the changes are. And so the big push now is to go, instead of looking at people who are demented, into looking earlier. Yep. Right? Get the biomarker profiles in people who are going to get demented, who are just starting to have the pathology, and, and start, try to identify the, the imaging signature of what's changing over time. So that's sort of where, where the imaging is at. As far as I know, I'm not an imager. So. I well, well, understand. The next question, um, uh, you know, this is wonderful what you've done. You should re be really proud of it. And as you said, you did stand on giants, but you've really carried it a long way. Thank you. Uh, is there blood and DNA and RNA being saved? Great question. So we can look at new biomarkers mm -hmm. potentially. Great question. So the question is, is there blood, DNA, and RNA? And CSF would be yeah. the other one. Yep. So uh, the ACT study uh, is not collecting CSF. They do collect blood. On every brain, we save a piece of frozen cerebellum no matter how long the postmortem interval so that we can get DNA because we learned the hard way in the past that when there wasn't. Uh, so there is blood on just about everybody. There should be DNA on everybody who dies. Uh, most of the people in these studies now are getting blood uh, as part of the study, and so they're getting DNA. In fact, most of the people in the Alzheimer's Center actually get this polygenic risk score for uh, the different 25 different risk variants that, that cause Alzheimer's disease. There's 25 different very rare uh, SNP differences that, that, that are risk variants. So, so we do have those kinds of resources, but not on everyone. Is that a lot available to outside research? Yes. Yes, although although there's much less of it, and it and the and the gatekeepers for that are the clinical studies, not the neural path core. Okay. I'm the gatekeeper. I'm the gatekeeper for the brains. That's just the way we set it up, and it wouldn't have it any other way. But the clinical studies are the gatekeepers for that information. So Thank the people you. have to go through there. Thank you. Yes, sir. What is the current thinking about the A B four risk? What, what is the mechanism? So the question is, what, what is the current thing about ABOE4 and mechanism of how it, how it is such a strong risk, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? The answer is still don't know. The ABOE shuttles cholesterol in the, systemically. In the brain, it seems to do other things. So ABOE is, uh, there's, been, there's a lot of literature, I was part of some of it, showing that ABOE4 is pro-inflammatory. So there, that may be part of a mechanism. ApoE4 seems to interact with A-beta differently than ApoE3, so that it may promote A-beta hetero, hetero, uh, 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 fibrillization. Uh, and, then, and then how ApoE interacts with the, with the lipid membrane of the cells and how that, how that affects cell transport in and out of A-beta, both from the cells and the vessels is all up for bids for ApoE4, and probably other things that I haven't heard of. So we don't know. It's a tough, it's a tough one. If we could, that's a prime suspect though, right? There's nothing that gives you the risk that ApoE does. Thank you everybody, appreciate you coming thoroughly. Let's try to Yes, sir. So we have two different ways that happen.